When we're not on camera, when we're not on YouTube, my girlfriend and I talk a lot about the history of Asia, politics of Asia, but inexorably and inevitably, my background as a scholar of Buddhism comes up again and again. And yesterday, Melissa asked me a question after a long conversation that covered and included not just Buddhism, but Taoism, Confucianism, other ancient philosophies from China that don't fall into any of these categories, stuff like the Han Feitze, um, the origins of the Han Dynasty. After a conversation like this, Melissa asked me, in effect, I think you, you worded it as, how comfortable are you now talking about Buddhism? Or even how comfortable will I be visiting Buddhist temples, talking to Buddhist monks, having those interactions, or talking to, to Buddhist professors? You also asked me, interesting question, you asked me, this is a really good question, actually. She asked, do I feel that I could make a positive difference in the world if I went back to university and got a master's degree or even a PhD in, in Buddhist studies? And my answer to that was yes. He was like, yeah, I actually do think that's an important and positive thing to do in the world. So the question I was going to ask you, for the sake of the audience, um, and obviously this is put in my head partly, because you know I have some fans of the channel who are ex-Buddhists, and some of them are pretty strident critics of Buddhist, Buddhism or even kind of anti-Buddhist. Um, I was going to ask you, to what extent do you feel that I am still, in effect, you know, a Buddhist? Or that I'm, I'm secretly Buddhist, I may be more Buddhist, you know, than I, than I say I am. And, like, look, I think, like, I think there's a real sincere question. Someone like Jordan Peterson, how Christian is he and how atheist is he? Sometimes the answer can't be found by just quoting the guy himself. You know, I think, I think there were a lot of historical figures like that. Um, you know, even, even someone as extreme as Mao Zedong, at the same time that he's burning down Buddhist temples and destroying historical literature, we know that privately he was really interested in and inspired by and postulated that stuff. Uh, new, new archaeological discoveries that happened during the life of Mao Zedong. He was really interested to read exactly these ancient texts that were at the same time banned for the general public to read and were to some extent being burned and destroyed. The question of, you know, what is someone's real ideological persuasion? Because, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't feel like I'm anti-Buddhist any more than I'd say I'm like anti-Shakespeare. You know what I mean? Like, I think this is a literature that's really kind of meaningful. And it's a philosophy, it's an ancient philosophy, there's a lot of flaws. But you know, you know, Aristotle has a lot of flaws, a lot wrong with Aristotle. So my question is, my question is how, how Buddhist is Isla Mazard? Also in that conversation, I asked, what do you yeah. think the role of Buddhism today is, or should be in, yes. in society, if you were actually inspiring people to go back and read the Pali Canon, and if right. they were if Buddhism really was taking on, you know, the aspects of the original canon uh, versus what it's become today in right. Zen Buddhism, for example, not uh, not Theravada Buddhism, which is what you yeah. used to study. Um, but, I mean, you know, so there are different sects, so it's hard for me to say, like, oh, well, I mean, you you're vegetarian, you're vegan. So in this way, like I associate right. this with Buddhism, but you've also told me that right. the Buddha didn't explicitly say to not eat meat. The so, Buddha ate meat. <laughs> yeah. So in this way, like I think, in in some people's perceptions of of Buddhists, I think you do embody some of the some of the characteristics. Like you don't drink alcohol. You you don't uh, you don't smoke cigarettes. You don't. Right. Uh, you, you live a very pious lifestyle in some right. ways. You, right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, we have this word within veganism. People talk about abolitionism and being an abolitionist vegan, as opposed to, um, I don't know, ameliorative or redu reducitarian or other schools of, of vegan thought. I mean, I, I think it's clear to say I'm not calling for the abolition of Buddhism in the same way that I do openly call basically for the abolition of, of Christianity, you know. So that, that's interesting. I mean, that's something you see even within the last couple of videos on this channel. And you see in my interactions with a couple of uh, supporters on Patreon I've got who are really, you know, more hard, disillusioned ex-Buddhists than I am. Oh, but in the same way, you've been very critical of actual practicing Buddhists. I mean, yes. what, what people say about Buddhism. You, yes. you Because you've 
read manuscripts, you've read stone inscriptions, right. you've done this hard work that so many people don't right. do in right. learning the right. original language. Okay. So I'm right. saying like you you are critical, like even more so than like of particular aspects of Buddhism right. and how it's how it's like right. you know but I think I'm not asking about critique because as you know I've, I've had to say this again again on the channel. If if you do film critique, it doesn't mean you want to abolish the film industry. It doesn't mean you want to end cinema or even that you want the particular film to fail or be taken into theaters. Like critique almost by definition is something productive and positive. Right. Like when you're right, I do I have critique of Buddhism, both Buddhist doctrine, you know, what's in the Buddhist philosophy, what's in the ancient texts, and the religion exists today. But I see the function of that critique as positive and as helping Buddhism. Mm. I think almost nobody would, would engage in that kind of critique if they didn't have a positive view of the future of Buddhism. And the film critic, I think, has a positive view of the future of cinema. Okay, sorry, I wanted to break in to, yeah, to make no, that clarification. It is, it is interesting, though, that you have this kind of contradiction, or I, I wouldn't say it's... I don't know if I'd go so far as to say it's, it's hypocrisy. But, you know, you don't believe... I don't think you ever were... a believer in hell in, in how right. it's described in the Pali canon right. uh, you're not somebody that <laughs> believes in supernatural aspects right. of religion um, but there there is some of this in Buddhism so I think you would be mm. an abolitionist of, of the, right. in this exactly. nature of it but you know uh, so can, can I stop yeah. this minute? so look if you're opposed to circumcision now to be explicit what we mean by circumcision is cutting off part of an infant's penis or with a female kind of part of the if you are morally opposed to circumcision then you have to be opposed to it in islam in christianity and judaism and any other re- well and there are other religions there are indigenous religions of australia um, there are some indigenous tribal religions that aren't part of any of the larger religious groups that have their own in south africa i've read about that indigenous tribal religions of, of that involve not exactly the same type of mutilation, but you know they have their own tradition this way. So if you're against it in one, you're going against the other. I think you know that's really hitting the nail on the head. If you're someone who basically wants to abolish the misconceptions within Christianity, then you'll also want to abolish those same misconceptions when you encounter them in Buddhism. So if you don't think if you don't think it's psychologically healthy for children to grow up believing in hell and heaven, let's put it that way. Like if you think that's bad to teach people that hell and heaven are a real place that people go to after they die, then you must also believe it is bad to teach that to children in Buddhism. Right. right? So, I mean, that puts a real fine point on it. But I think the difference is, like, when I look at Christianity and I look at Buddhism, I can't look at Christianity and say, okay, even if I delete these things I really think are bad, then there's still something really positive and important left over. And with Buddhism, I do feel that way. Yeah. I think most modern people do. They're just not comfortable saying it. Like, if we, to use the word delete, if we delete hell and we delete heaven, even if you delete meditation and reincarnation, if you delete kind of all the supernatural stuff, hey, there's still a body of literature, a body of philosophy here that I think is of value that something positive could come out of in the future or something positive, something positive could be done with right now. And it pro- probably is somewhere. <laughs> I, I, I don't know of anywhere. I'm being honest with you. I don't know. I don't know any good Buddhist monks. I don't know any good Buddhist authors. I don't know a single good Buddhist university professor in the Western world. Like, it's that bad. It's that bad, the state of the state of the religion, the state of even the scholarship and, and academic side. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. What do you... I, I, I cut you off because I think, I think that's really the crucial point is if you don't just look at it as a category... You know, Buddhism. Well, like the history of Buddhism, for example, Tibetan Buddhism included human sacrifice, and you know, like manufacturing a bowl out of a human skull after the person's dead and magical. So, if you're against, if you're against human sacrifice, but you know, obviously, everyone in the modern world has to say, well, I don't believe in hell and human sacrifice, but there's still some value in Buddhism. They think, right? Now, I get, I, I can't say this. I can't make this kind of statement about Islam. I can't say that if you if you just you know remove the things I object to in the in the Quran and the Hadith that there's still some philosophy there I I value or you know or even even cultural commentary or something like even even the material in the Pali Canon that's just kind of reflecting on slavery and poverty I, talk, I mentioned that recently you know the role of poverty in how I approach Buddhism yeah poverty and desire and, you know, is life fundamentally about happiness and self-indulgence or is life about something else and self-discipline? There's a lot there morally and aesthetically I relate to possibly. And let's point out, 
I relate to those same doctrines positively when I encounter them in ancient Athens, in ancient Rome, in other contexts. So again, right. it's the same thing where you, you break down the category into particular philosophies or something, and then you can... Then you can see that. Do you, okay, you, you, I don't know if I really have anything to add. <laughs> I mean, if, if the original question... My question was, do you feel like you married a Buddhist? <laughs> I mean, no, li- no, life no. with me is it is it kind of Buddhisty or no? <laughs> no, I, you aren't. I mean, yeah. you don't chant. You don't. You yeah, know, right. Like they're they're right. they're none of the right, right. The the, right. the fixtures or you know, yeah. Those. No, but I mean that's you know, and that's okay. That's a really good example. So I, I mentioned this to Melissa before. I met a particular woman in China who, although she was born Chinese. She really converted to Theravada Orthodox Buddhism, which is very rare. She did the research, and she realized that it's really the Pali Canon that's the more authentic form of Buddhism. And she and her family, um, they would chant Pali together. And they, you know, she admitted they really didn't know how to pronounce Pali. So they were kind of chanting Pali in a Chinese accent or in Chinese monosyllables, I would imagine. Um, so people who chant ancient texts... You know, I would study ancient texts, but like even if it were Shakespeare, do you really want to memorize Shakespeare? You know, memorization is a powerful tool. You know, okay, are you just studying this text and reciting it to memorize it? You, you may not know this. The vast majority of people who engage in those practices in, in Buddhism, they believe that there is literally magic being released by the words, by saying them out loud. To give an example, um, a Buddhist monk who will write out sutras in Pali, uh, sutanta is the correct word by the way, but who write out a scripture in Pali using chalk on a chalkboard, they will then collect the chalk dust and make that into a kind of magical elixir. Yeah, so the chalk dust that's been formed into the words of the Buddha. And you know, naturally this lends itself to, I've read a really tear-jerking story, a really heartbreaking story about a, a guy in Cambodia, a guy who was fighting against communism in Cambodia, and he had a, he had a magical Buddhist piece of cloth with words words from the Pali Canon written on this cloth that he was wearing to give himself, you know, invulnerability or you know that that was that was the purpose of it you know to save your life in war that if you wore this you know give you some magical powers his belief in the words and when he was condemned to death he was going to be put in a firing line firing squad by the communists um, he 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 took off the uh, he took off the, the, the magical magical piece of cloth and he handed it to a Frenchman who was standing there. A Frenchman was a was a scholar, not a special He said, no, I want the Frenchman to have it. And that's he's the witness who wrote the story of, of this happening. He was shot and killed. But in a sense, you know, it's the ultimate kind of pathos of wanting the magic to survive. You know, if he dies wearing this amulet that gives him invulnerability, then you'll lose faith in the invulnerability. But if he takes it off and goes to his death then the belief in the magic power of the word is, is still there. So, you know, people people chant, you know, again, I, I would disagree with that. If it's magical chanting, if it's not just like studying the same way you'd study Shakespeare or study Aristotle or study Plato, and maybe maybe you want to, maybe you want to memorize the words of Aristotle or Plato or, or you know, just for the philosophical value of it or for some other reason, you really want to commit to the text that way. Um, but, you know, a Catholic monk in Ireland marching back and forth and chanting the same words in Latin again and again. If there are a few monasteries in Ireland who still do that. If I object to that belief in magical chanting and Catholicism, then I've got to object to it also in, in Buddhism. Right. So this is how, but I mean, these examples for people who know and care about Buddhism, this is where it cuts it so close, where, where some Buddhists would feel that I'm anti-Buddhist. If you don't believe the words are magical, why do you study them? And my answer is maybe if you study them, you'll figure out that they have real value that's not magical. Mm-hmm. You know? And again, I can't say that about all religions. I really can't say that there's some... I don't feel there's any great philosophy to be discovered in reading the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. I don't feel that Moses was a great philosopher. I don't at all. I would really say the opposite. It's kind of, there are some historically interesting things about you know, studying Moses and the Bible. I, I cannot say that. But where with Buddhism, when you delete all these things and have a kind of secular analytical attitude, that there is is still really some positive value there.